Hey guys, it's Jack. I just wanted to talk to you today about a way that you can help support the podcast. If you're not already, we would really appreciate it. If you guys went and reviewed us on Apple or Spotify, those reviews really help people find the podcast and help it get recognized. And, uh, you know, if you've been enjoying the show, we really appreciate your support. Another thing that you can do to support the channel is to become a Patreon member. So we have Patreon memberships that start at just $5 a month. And when you sign up, you get access to all of our episodes ad-free. Uh, that's the big bonus for that. I mean, we also do some Patreon bonus episodes for our subscribers. Uh, but this is the, the biggest and best way that you can support the Team House channel and podcast uh, if you'd like to. And we really appreciate that. So go in and check us out at patreon.com slash the team house. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Eyes On. And uh, all right, D, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce you very quickly, not because sure. you are less important than our guest. Um, but of course, we have, uh, have D. That's a fair uh, assessment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But most importantly, we have as our guest uh, someone who has uh, been on Team House before, Mick Mulroy. Uh, also, the, importantly, someone I count as a friend. Uh, that's not why he's here. He's here because he is the former, uh, I'm going to mess this up, I always uh, do, DASNI, um, uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low-Intensity Conflict, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. But, oh, for the, East, <laughs> for the Middle East. Yeah, yeah for the Middle yeah. East. Oh, I'm for the Middle East. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. I And uh, former CIA paramilitary officer, and perhaps most importantly, former Marine, which is why, which is why Jason's not here today because uh, Jack has a very strict policy of no, yeah. no three Marine Marines on two air is the at cap. the same time. Two is the cap. If, <laughs> if I had more than one, if I had more than two, I'd get my ass chewed from Jack. Yeah. So. No, seriously, we had, we did have complaints. We had one. I, oh, Alex, Alex Hollings. We had three Marines here, and um, yeah. Yeah, and we were criticized for not being sufficiently joined. Can you believe that? Anyway, <laughs> um, Mick, uh, Mick, Mick also runs the Lobo Institute. I'm going to let him talk about that. And um, uh, he's uh, he's involved in something very important right now that he can't talk about. We can discuss obliquely without jeopardizing the, the operation itself. But you heard it first here on Eyes On. Mick, welcome. <laughs> and you are absolutely in stream of consciousness mode as far as I am concerned. So please, far away. So great to be here with you guys from Montana. And usually if people are watching, if I get out of their way, you can see that it is in fact Montana. Um, so uh, super happy to be on with you guys. You mentioned Lobo Institute. That is the company that myself and Eric Ulrich, a, a former squadron commander, retired uh, SEAL from uh, Dev Group, founded around five years ago. The principle behind it is it brings uh, former military folks, intelligence folks together, along with former humanitarians, whether it's UN, USAID, or private NGOs. So it's a mixture, of course, Andy is part of it, uh, uh, but it's a mixture of groups that that can take the skills that they've learned and experience that they've had in their past life, uh, kind of fuse them together to do good in conflict areas today. Uh, and that is exactly what we're doing and we've done it in Afghanistan, uh, uh, Yemen, and Can you, can you and give now, some, uh, some examples of the work that, that you've done? Mick, I'm, I'm of course familiar with it, but it's, um, you know, it's a lot of uh, kind of good stuff, in my view, under the radar, uh, which, yeah. you know, but um, but yeah. but please. Share. And and it goes to redress the balance, perhaps the perception of guys like, you know, us as being mm -hmm. unconcerned with with, uh, uh, you know, with the with social issues. Right. International. Um, I'm I'm stumbling here, but you know what I'm trying to say is that we are indeed warm-hearted human beings um, uh, with empathy uh, that extends beyond the borders of the United States, and and you and your peers are proving that. I agree, and I think we're seeing a lot more than just the Lobo Institute do this. Like if you look at the fall of Afghanistan, just how many vets stepped up to do what was essentially purely humanitarian effort to get our partners out of harm's way. Uh, some people, I mean, literally, and, you know, I was part of it, you were part of it, um, you know, basically threw away their whatever job they were doing to make that happen. And I think we're seeing that continue. Uh, so that that's that is true. There is a lot of former military folks, former soft 
folks that are getting into that. And they're quite frankly, really good at it because that is the environment they spent their whole career in very dynamic, you know, environments of which you have to figure things out. There's not a lot of answers. There's not a lot of books written about it and you have to do it with personality. You have to do it with tenacity. And I think we're seeing a lot more of our brethren uh, get into that. And it's a good thing. So what we've done specifically, we have worked long-term on Afghanistan. So we just finished the program. It was, it went on since the, uh, essentially the withdrawal that we had uh, until recently working with the State Department on people that did not have the ability to get out because they didn't meet the immigration requirements for special immigrant visas. But as far as the Taliban was concerned, they were on the chopping block. So the worst case scenario, they can't come out because they don't have the qualifications, the time, et cetera. But the Taliban still knows they work directly with the U.S. government. Uh, some you know, straight with the military or the agency, some just with the State Department or even the Agriculture Department. So people that were far removed from anything the Taliban should have cared about, they were still on the chopping block, uh, literally, uh, for that. So we work with them both from a security side to make sure- Which, which stayed... wasn't well covered at the time, right? I mean, there was a lot of- right. Uh, there was a lot of media attention on uh, what what was the category that we put, you know, the, the special sensitive uh, individuals right. that we wanted to get out. But the yeah, Taliban, like the commandos, as you point out. Yeah. yeah. The commandos and the CTPTs or the zero units got a lot of attention as they should. They were certainly the highest on the list of the Taliban. But this is more, this is even like doctors or uh, agricultural engineers and people who worked with the U.S. Agriculture Department to make Afghanistan a better place, you know, just, but they were still on the list. So we took our security skills and our humanitarian. So got them food and medicine and everything they needed, but also kept them one step ahead of the Taliban. And we did that uh, for quite a long time. How do you, how do you do fundraising? Nick? Cause I, I, you know, you, you guys do these things, uh, but I, but I don't see a lot of kind of uh, visible fundraising. And I'm just, that's right. That's I've got true. very raw memories of the Mozart group where that consumed, you know, maybe 80% of my time, you know, that wasn't in operations. Right. So we worked for the state department on that project. So we didn't have to fundraise. We've Excellent. worked in Yemen uh, for the United nations um, for working for whom now is a good friend of mine, Martin Griffith, who is the overall humanitarian undersecretary uh, general for the United Nations. But at the time, he was the UN yeah. Special Envoy. Anyway. Um, and so that's, we worked for them. It was a, it was a direct, uh, uh, you know, business, not business, but, a you know, an advisory relationship with the UN. And now we're doing stuff specifically uh, with Gaza. But that's, that's, it's not sensitive in a sense, like it's not some covert operate. It's none of that. It's just pure humanitarian but it's in the middle of setting up, and that's why I really can't get into the details of that right now. But I can't yeah, make, talk um, about do you, the issue. Do you, do you want me to just kind of frame it, and and then you know you can we we can talk our way through it without you being on on thin ice? Does sure. that make and sense? It's like, yeah, I, or you can just talk about you know I'm an analyst for ABC, so I'm happy to talk yeah. about all the issues that you guys. Want. Yeah, yeah. Please. If I could just say one more thing about Lobo Institute, we also run an NGO called In Child Soldiering. Uh, which is a 501c3, uh, and it is exactly what it says. You know, it's a, it's an NGO dedicated to stop the use of children in armed conflict, which is a, a horrible uh, problem that's growing uh, every day, quite frankly, because these conflicts continue, and the and the people fighting them keep getting younger and younger. And we've gone far away from you know old men starting wars and old men fighting wars. It's now not just old men starting wars and young men fighting wars. It's it's kids fighting wars uh, who have absolutely no choice and are used essentially as fodder. Uh, so we have an uh, NGO. We did a documentary on two former LRA soldiers. Uh, the documentary is called My Star in the Sky. It's going to be made into, it is made into a book called uh, All the Glimmering Stars, which will come out by Amazon in May. So uh, if you see all the plug, plug it. It's oh. Mark Sullivan. Mark Sullivan, okay. uh, a, a great friend who's a Montana author and, a New York Times bestselling author, heard about the story, came to us, went to Uganda with us, met everybody. And uh, in, in uh, I can be happy to send you a book. I've got the advanced copies. 
Yeah, um, that'll that'll get talk. that'll get yeah. you a a launch segment on this podcast. <laughs> Seriously, no, we're, that's what we're, we need. We'll bring Mark. Yeah, we'll bring. I mean, because it, it's yes. a fascinating story. Yeah, and I'll put all yes. the links and everything mm. into the description to the Lobo Institute and to the. I don't know if the docs out yet, but for like the pre order for the book and everything like that, I'll put yes. it all in the description. Yep, it's in. It's out for pre order, and a portion of the book is going to our five hundred one c three, and our five hundred one c three only. Uh, contributes to groups that are out in the field doing, you know, the work with the kids to rehabilitate them. There's no, there's no salaried employee in it. Just so you know. Um, but the, and it, this could be, volunteers. yeah, yeah. It's us straight volunteers, mm -hmm. and it goes straight to the groups that are actually out there teaching a former soldier how to fix a truck or how to plant, you know, a garden or you know, raise sheep or what yeah. have you. It's directly to the rehabilitation alternate means of living yeah yeah exactly yet yeah, so uh, the the situation now in 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 gaza um i of course am one of your many fans on abc uh you know i'm not just saying that to be sycophantic actually mick mick mick's one of those welcome faces you're not the, you you're not the sycophantic type yeah. <laughs> no no but i mean wait no mick's one of those welcome the welcome faces on tv you know because there are some guys who get dragged out to talk, you know, military expert, former lieutenant colonel, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, this guy either talks dross or he's reading from the cover of the New York Times. But uh, but Mick really gives it a, um, uh, I, I think I think in the short segment that you're allowed, uh, you you really do, do uh, have the knack of breaking down complicated things for the American public. So congrats on that. But yeah, <laughs> having built up the pressure on you, please, yeah, talk about, uh, talk about Gaza. Yes, a uh, big topic, obviously, and it's been all-consuming for much of us for the last uh, several months. I think the stage we're at now is we have a, a dire humanitarian uh, crisis going on. Um, before the war started, there was around 500 trucks of food aid coming in, plus about the same amount of commercial, you know, for sale material coming in and about 60% of the population relied on it. Now there's about 30 trucks coming in a day of food aid. Sometimes it gets to hundred and 100% of the 2.3 million uh, person population relies on it. So we're seeing so how many, how many should that be Mick in order to sustain the local population? Do, do we know if you can break that into daily truckloads? Yes. So if if we were now because we have a hundred percent of the population before it was sixty, you could you could add to about nine hundred truckloads of direct humanitarian aid is needed uh, to come into Gaza and not just into the southern part because the infrastructure and we can get into the, the conflict itself, but the infrastructure is so damaged that they can't get up into the northern part of the country. We're around. It's hard to estimate, but uh, from talking directly to the IDF. Uh, they estimate around 400,000 people are still up in the north, essentially uh, living in the rubble, and they have a very difficult time getting aid to them. So that's why I think a lot of these countries started the airdrops. Um, they, they are, I think, everybody would acknowledge a drop in the bucket, even with the U.S., who is the, you know, biased, but the most effective at doing this, every drop's around two to three truckloads, right? So uh, that's why there is this big push to open a maritime corridor um, in which you can deliver aid in bulk, uh, basically doubling, if not tripling, the aid that's coming in now. And then as it develops, uh, quadrupling and whatever comes after quadruple, um, aid into, into parts of Gaza, which can't be reached right, right now. So yeah, that, that is something that the president referenced in his State of the Union and something that needs to happen. And and so that's a really, that's, you know, the, that's part of the, one of the hardest parts of distribution, right? One is, you know, one, one is entry point into Gaza, getting through that bottleneck, but the other is distribution within Gaza to these areas, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's exactly right. That, that's a, that's going to be a tough nut that and as yet is unsolved, but you are working on solving. That is, that's a good point, Andy. So, and, and the answer isn't whether it should be air, ground, or maritime. The answer is all the above, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so lots of people create these, you know, these kind of false 
choices here. We need to have entry points, ground. We need to have airdrops until we have stabilized the situation, and we need to obviously have a maritime corridor. But to your point on distribution, that has gotten very difficult. We saw uh, the, the the rushing of the trucks in which uh, people were either run over or were shot by IDF troops that thought they uh, had a, a they posed a threat. I don't know the answer to that, but that's generally what happened. So it's going to be difficult. Uh, I think the way to deal with this is to try to flood the zone with humanitarian aid. And that means substantial amounts of airdrops done by competent people. Um, I, you know, the U.S. should be leading that effort. We saw, unfortunately, that a non-U.S. airdrop yesterday had multiple failures uh, of parachutes that crushed uh, six kids. Uh, and that, I know that happens, but it was also when I looked at it, dropped right over the city. Yeah. Uh, and as you, you are well known, you don't want to be under one of mm -hmm. these pallets, even if it does have a fully deployed parachute. So yeah. the U.S. is going to do it in a manner that drops it close enough to people can get to it, but not directly, you know, over their current, uh, you know, where they reside. Um, yeah. That needs to happen, but it needs to also be uh, pointed out that it will never meet the demand. So it yeah. needs to be supplemental and, to uh, and again needs point. to in in order to work or integrate needs um someone on the ground frankly to to help with distribution um otherwise you get kind of a survival of the fittest thing right with airdrops that's part of the problem is that you know right. the, the groups or people who are most able to get hold of those supplies are the ones who get hold of those that's supplies. right that's right and the, and to the distribution it should be under the the UN under the international aid organizations that are there, and it probably should be Palestinians to be, uh, yeah. to be frank. But of course, that also needs to be done completely in line with Israeli concern, cons yeah. security concerns. I mean, it isn't a, you know, a secret that Hamas was armed to the teeth, uh, and a lot of that came in smuggled. Some of them potentially with humanitarian assistance. And uh, we saw what ha happened on October 7th. So this needs to be a balance with a critical need for innocent Palestinian civilians to be able to, you know, get food, medicine, and clean water, and Israelis' security concerns that they don't see another October 7th. So that, that is the balance. And then, of course, this is all happening at a time when Hamas uh, finds it completely acceptable to not only hide amongst its civilian population, but to exploit the conditions that they're in for their own political gain. In my opinion, they actually don't mind that there is all these horrible things going on. They use it for their own political benefit. They often steal uh, food from uh, civilians that otherwise can't defend themselves to be able to get it, and then they just hoard it from themselves. So all those things are a balance, uh, but ultimately a little kid is a little kid, uh, no matter or an innocent civilian is, is an innocent civilian and they and they should uh, not have to, you know, be on the brink of starvation because of uh, Hamas's actions against uh, Israel. Mick, has anything been done then to, and I know this is a very tough question, uh, to to coordinate or, or raise a, and, and I use the term with small, you know, a Palestinian authority in, in Gaza, uh, UNRWA has been discredited uh, in the sense that uh, it's been discredited. I mean, do, trying to work through UNRWA with the Israelis is the, all kinds of reasons, probably not a good idea at this stage. Um, but is there a, are there any alternatives as far as local humanitarian association uh, organizations that the IDF will let function? So that is a very complex, but good question. So UNRWA was created in, literally in 1949. There's about 13,000 employees in Gaza. All of them are Palestinians. A handful uh, took part in the October 7th attacks, which is completely unacceptable. But more, uh, I think, concerning is essentially the Hamas headquarters was right under the UNRWA headquarters. It was tied in for, for electricity and everything. So in my opinion, opinion that was known to those who ran UNRWA. Uh, so it is it is understandably not an organization of which Israel uh, will work with. Uh, but unfortunately, that was the infrastructure, the complex overtime infrastructure to, to distribute aid. So I hope there is a compromise that can be uh, where we can utilize individuals 
that are in that network to distribute aid and then vet them for their connections to terrorist organizations like Hamas. And if they are, they need to be out of any uh, group that's funded by the United Nation, which, of course, 22 percent of the funding comes from the United States. Uh, but the United States and the United Nations itself should just find that unacceptable. But the problem is there is innocent civilians that need to have aid distributed. So there's no easy answer. But I think working together with the Israelis and the U.N. and the international community, there needs to be uh, a way to get this aid distributed uh, time now. Hey guys, it's Jack. I just wanted to talk to you today about a way that you can help support the podcast if you're not already. We would really appreciate it if you guys went and reviewed us on Apple or Spotify. Those reviews really help people find the podcast and help it get recognized. And, uh, you know, if you've been enjoying the show, we really appreciate your support. Another thing that you can do to support the channel is to become a Patreon member. So we have Patreon memberships that start at just $5 a month. And when you sign up, you get access to all of our episodes ad-free. Uh, that's the big bonus for that. I mean, we also do some Patreon bonus episodes for our subscribers. Uh, but this is the, the biggest and best way that you can support the Team House channel and podcast uh, if you'd like to. And we really appreciate that. So go in and check us out at patreon.com slash the team house. So right now, I mean, I, I know U.S. efforts uh, that are under discussion now about setting up a, uh, you know, a, a port offshore, maybe JLOPs, so it, it joint logistics over the shore um, capability. I, I feel I feel compelled to spell that out. But, Please, thank but, you. But there's, but there's things that, uh, yes, the U.S. military can put in place. We can talk about security later, but it takes time. You know, it takes the, the, to get through the, you know, get everyone in place, probably weeks. And the need now is immediate. Um, so, when, you know, news yesterday in in, uh, in reliable media about kids, you know, starving, as you point out. And literally, I mean, they, I think uh, five kids yesterday starved to death in, uh, in, in central Gaza. So they... The need is immediate. The EU is on is talking about now um, sending opening a maritime corridor. Right? Is that? I mean, what are the prospects of that working well? And obviously, that what are the plans going ahead to integrate that with with your efforts? I mean, do you think that's that's going to be something that that helps, or do you think it's just impractical? I think it, it will absolutely help in a manner that is much more effective than any other current option, whether that option is tied to mechanics like airdrops not being sufficient or tied to politics like opening other entry points from Israel into Gaza. Essentially, the families of the hostages, uh, understandably, you know, uh, you have to put yourself in their shoes, are blocking it because they want their loved one out, whoever yeah. should have been taken hostage. So there's a political aspect to that that's, that it makes it very difficult. And the maritime corridor can bring more aid in than either of the other two. So I do think it's something that is going to happen. The president mentioned it in the State of the Union. I do think it will be a public-private partnership. So the U.S. military will do things like uh, create this uh, pier, which commercial entities can use. Uh, but there's other, other options to create temporary uh, birthing uh, sites that can offload aid into Gaza right now. So I think that will be uh, very complimentary and in 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 unison, uh, and it can happen in relatively short time if the international aid community does more than just uh, talk. That they start um, contributing to plans that they believe are are very effective and can be done. If they do that, this 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 can. The desperation currently in Gaza, especially in the north, can be alleviated within weeks, I think, potentially a month. Uh, we could have it stabilized. And then, of course, there will be uh, the other discussions on the how, how the war is going to end, whether Rafa should happen, the, uh, the assault down there, and then um, how we're going to go forward on any kind of diplomatic solution where this doesn't become a continuous cycle. Mick, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned like... Uh... You know, it needs to be a multi-pronged attack, right? Like air, land, whatever. I mean, what role does Egypt play? I mean, they share a border with Gaza. Sure, it's southern. In the majority of the aid needs to go to the north. Um, what do they like? Where's what's their role? Do they do anything? 
Yeah, so they're 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 a significant partner both in aid coming into Egypt and then coming through the Rafa Gate, which is where a majority of the aid's coming from now. Even though it's been shut down several times, and of course we're looking at a potential assault on the Rafa area, which could completely shut down the Rafa crossing. To no fault, of course, in, to the Egyptians. Uh, but that is something that could happen. They're also playing a significant part in the ceasefire negotiations, uh, Egypt, the United States, and obviously Israel and Hamas and Qatar are playing to try to come with, up with a currently right now a temporary six week uh, truce, if you will, so that aid can flow in more readily, the hostages can be released, uh, and that we can start a long term discussion on how this war will end including potentially for Hamas leaders to depart uh, Gaza. There's a lot of different aspects. In, in the same way, discuss. same way, I guess, Arafat left um, uh, Beirut for uh, Tunis, right? Yes. Back in 82, exactly. similar. Uh, Mick, does, do these plans depend on a ceasefire? So the humanitarian plan does not necessarily need to depend on a ceasefire. And I think that's where the U.S. government has been very forceful. Um, we can't use the deprivation of civilians from food as a negotiation point. And yeah. I'm not saying Israel's doing that. Um, but that, but I said that, tie, that was, a, that was yeah. a comment by the president, actually, yesterday. Yeah. Right. So very right. pointed. Right. You know. Right. I mean, and I, you know, we have, uh, as you would guess in Lobo, a lot of connections to the IDF, a lot of very good friends. So I'm not saying that they're doing that. But if it's perceived to be, we will let aid into people uh, civilians, women and children who are starving, if you do that, that is not, I think, an effective uh, yeah. way of, of uh, bargaining from the international communities, including the United States perspective. Uh, yeah. So I do think this should go ahead regardless of uh, an agreement on the ceasefire. Yeah, that's, um, thanks. That, that, that was a key question that has not been covered in the media. Uh, I think yeah. probably because a lot of people don't know, you know, they're speculating. That's right. That's right. Yeah, anything more as soon as possible. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about was the security. I know, you know, security plan. It hasn't even been worked out. But, you know, for the benefit of the audience, and the you, we've all got memories of Afghanistan, right, fresh in mind about the fact that if you have, uh, yes, I'm not comparing the IDF to the Taliban, but if you have someone providing security in, in an outer zone like that, um, you, you're taking a risk if it's not your people, bottom line, right? And so we're kind of potentially as U.S. in that position again, whereby we don't put boots on the ground, all right? You know, I, I know we're, you know, there's going to be some some uh, exceptions to that, uh, particular capabilities, but nevertheless, um, for the most part, you know, so, so doing this offshore, but still very much a target, reliant on um the israelis to to provide security on shore again not a not a hit on any other partner nation force but but just doctrinally that always feels i mean you know even in soft you you try to avoid that as much as you can where you're totally dependent on an unknown <laughs> un, right. unknown uh quantity right that's um, right so and, and that's and, going to be a hard part yes and as you know the idf is a very capable uh, military force, right? And they have some really good units, and overall, they're they're uh, uh, you know really really a, an effective uh, military. So I think there is going to have to be a component where the IDF does secure any of these uh, landing sites, these uh, aid delivery sites on the beach. Uh, but the UN also has certain requirements that they're not essentially in complete. Uh, cooperation so they're not on top of each other so that's going to have to be worked out there'll have to be some effective way it's president said there's not going to be u.s military on the ground so that's mm -hmm. not going to happen and that's you know i think we don't want to see something like uh somalia happen where you know we get there and everybody greets the u.s military uh the marine corps as uh you know saviors and then you know three weeks later they decide that we're not right and then they're shooting at us and then there's a war and then there's you know uh what happened uh with black hawk down so i think there, that makes sense. Uh, but it does, and they don't need to be. They don't need to be. There's mm -hmm. effective ways to distribute aid because this is not a military effort. This is a humanitarian effort. So, uh, yeah. in using the Palestinians, right? It's, as you well know, for all your time 
it, as uh, in, in counterinsurgency type warfare, it's more it's difficult and different when it's your uncle's distributing the aid on behalf. Right. Absolutely. You tend not to want yeah. to shoot at your uncle or your nephew or your brother. So it needs to be Palestinians ultimately that are distributing the aids to Palestinians because that is different. That is viewed differently. So that kind of interface between what entity that's coming to the beach uh is and then what entity is distributing it to the palestinian people that needs to be worked out but ultimately it needs to be the palestinian people under the uh, uh umbrella of the united nations in, in validated international aid uh organizations so those that are there for the right reasons distributing it under the principles of humanitarian aid not for political reasons not to you know that's that needs to happen and i think that is uh, essentially where this will be going with the IDF, of course, uh, overwatching just in case it, it turns into a, you know, a simple disruption situation that becomes dangerous, not only for the people that are distributing it, but the people that are there to get it, of course, because yeah. ultimately they end up being just as much as the victims as anybody else. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the administration has said, look, we're not waiting on the Israelis to to execute this but of course the reality is that we do need uh their their own uh complicity if not i mean we need that collaboration and what's going to be interesting to see though is whether uh the you know the the operation still goes ahead even if hamas overtly opposes it which seems unlikely that you know that would be just a, a really bad pr call for for hamas uh, which is which yeah. is a card in, on, in in our favor, right? I say. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's. Uh, I mean, they, they have showed a callous disregard for the people of Palestine, right? I mean, yeah. the atrocities on October seventh, uh, and we don't have to repeat them here. But if you're not, people, your audience isn't familiar with them, um, they're so atrocious. I don't even know that there's a word for it. So I think they did so knowing that that would cause a reaction. Of course, that yeah. would bring this on to. Gossip. I mean, you don't. You didn't have to be a political deliberately designed. Yeah. Deliberately yeah. designed to do that. Yeah. Absolutely. And they, and ever since then, they've hid right under, uh, you know, not just their civilian population, but the most significant part, like schools and hospitals, right? So people mm -hmm. that are the most vulnerable and who who the military or any security force should be designed to protect the most. Uh, I think they used him and the consequences of their actions, uh, trying to uh, politically and unfortunately effectively in some cases but yes i do think to your point they would be hard pressed to attack humanitarians uh distributing aid palestinians to palestinian people who are on the verge of starvation i agree yeah they, which which means we hope that that is not a precondition you know hamas uh explicitly approving is not a, a precondition of the op that's right that's right it shouldn't be hey, do you before think that I got one. Sorry, more. go ahead. Do you yeah. think there's any chance that IDF or the Israeli government in general will drag their feet with this, especially if they're providing the security? So, I, I don't think so. I, I mean, there's different political uh, wins, if you will, in Israel, just like there is in the United States. Uh, I'm not a political analyst, but essentially, this won't happen unless they agree. So, those that are concerned that this would have a negative impact on the Israeli security, I would simply say it's not going to happen unless the Israelis agree with it. So if they're okay with it, they're the people that are most, I think, concerned about their own security. I think yeah. that should be an indicator to anybody else that they, they believe it does not harm their security. So if it goes ahead, uh, that would be my, my position to people who are concerned about uh, whether this would jeopardize Israeli security is they don't think so. I, I think, you know, if I, yeah, it, yeah, you know, just a quick opinion on this, that I think you can overstate the threat when, when you have an ongoing operation like this, you can overstate the threat of having weapons come in. The real thing that you're concerned about are fighters escaping and being able to return or coming into areas where you've already cleared, you know, I'm talking about from experience in, in Fallujah, you know, it didn't make any difference to us at this stage whether weapons or, or munitions are coming in because as a process, they have to be integrated. In. You know, it takes time and they're very vulnerable while they're doing that. But the other point is uh, that um, 
that's been overlooked on this and this isn't a hit on the israelis you know i suppose it is but it could equally be a hit on us too that uh new york times did you know one of their investigative reports which are generally pretty good and came up with the conclusion that most of the munitions used in the rocket attacks on 7 october actually or a lot of it significant proportion came from the idf themselves from all the ordnance they dropped on gaza my point is that if you're fighting in if you're in Hamas fighting in Gaza right now, you want food, you want water, you want shelter, you want a mean freedom of movement. You don't. You, you're probably not that low on ammunition, I would guess. You know, what I mean, um, right. so so you can overstate the threat of weapons coming in. That's what I'm saying, and right. I, I'm not saying the Israelis are. I'm saying you can overstate it, and that and that causes problems as we've seen when it's got another humanitarian convoys. There's a broader like yeah. talk to this. Like you talk about, like you know, they're concerned about Israel. Israel, Israel's concerned about their security. It kind of seems like October sixth, they really weren't, or they were asleep at the job. I mean, Ooh, I know that's a longer, longer. That's a I know it episode. is. I know it's more of a broader topic <laughs> yeah. in that, like similar to us, you know, pre nine eleven. I guess. I mean, I mean, I guess we understood what was going to happen. Mm. We had a good idea of it, but we dropped the ball. There yeah, are a lot of parallels here to that, you know, yeah. and and I'm not saying going into Afghanistan was a mistake. I don't think it was. But what happened over the last 20 years after that were probably there were some miscues. Um, I think he, Israel's running the running the risk of doing the same thing, because what's the end game in reality? And, yeah, it is a longer conversation, but can they really destroy no, Hamas? Question. Is is Hamas going to go and go to Qatar and live in like a luxury condos and not worry about Mossad? coming to like put two in the back of their heads like we got to be realistic with this right like i don't know what's the actual end game for hamas and for israel i don't see it sure to, to both of your points uh and you're right it is a longer discussion but at first it was clear it was an intelligence failure we thought right and and that's they have an exceptional intelligence service but so do we and to your point d we had 9 11 right so it's it's more of a critique uh, with an intent to improve than just, you know, criticism. But then we found out that a lot of the intelligence was already known, right? That came out clearly in the media. They almost had their op order. I mean, they even knew yeah. what they were going to do, when they were yeah. going to do it. If you talk to, you know, obviously I spent a lot of time in Israel recently. If you talk to them, um, they consider it, uh, and I'm speaking for all of them, at least people I talked to, particularly in the IDF, and, a leadership uh, failure in that they yeah. had a lot of the information and it wasn't acted on. So I think the, because it didn't services, fit, it didn't fit their right. preconceptions. Right. They just said that's impossible. They wouldn't do that. They don't have the capabilities, yeah. but they essentially had somebody that was very close to the operational planning uh, because, you know, from the press reports, it laid out what was going to happen. Uh, so if you mm -hmm. talk to, and none of them, of course, will talk uh, on the record, but IDF, in, in intelligence folks, they obviously uh, take a lot of the responsibility themselves, but they'll also say uh, this was fairly well known and it wasn't taken serious. So the, uh, that needs to be. Viewed yeah, sorry, go like ahead. We man. did yeah. with the yeah. effects. Yeah, I'm just saying it needs to be reviewed and just like we did. We they need to adjust accordingly. Yeah. So it isn't just criticism for criticism's sake. It's uh, it's you know we want our partners to, uh, you know, improve their own security. D, that's a really. You know, great. I mean, it's a great question, and and I wasn't. Uh, I yeah, absolutely. We should put a whole podcast on this. Specifically, when I was in Israel this time, I asked that question of four, two former national security advisors, a former deputy of Shin Bet. Um, I mean, you know, I'm not just trolling this on to, in an effort to impress, but I, you know, I wasn't just getting speculation from dudes on the ground. Here's here's some very quick points. Okay, the night before the attack. Um, something between 40 and 80 new SIM cards, Israeli SIM cards popped up on the network within Gaza. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. The, the ability now, the, the Israeli uh, ability to pick up signals intelligence within Gaza was awesome. You know, there's only two phone carriers within Gaza, so they could pick up It's just a question as Mick knows of data, like anything in signals intelligence, how many people you assign uh, to it. But this, this triggered interest, more than interest. So the head of Shin Bet uh, got up in the middle of the night, drove into the office, uh, called uh, the chief of staff of the army. To put this in context, I was talking 
to a former commander of the, the Gaza division, all right? And he said, hey, look, within the, the midst of the fighting in 2014, he called the chief of staff maybe two times. But here, you know, here you have the head of Shin Bet waiting up, waking up the head of the army, the head of the IDF, essentially. And they're talking about what these SIM cards mean. Now, who recommended what will come out in the investigation? But the bottom line was they agreed together that this was probably just a, you know, a periodic exercise because this happens from time to time. Um, but as Mick points out, what they didn't do necessarily was synthesize this latest indicator with a whole bunch of things that were being officially reported, um, most famously perhaps by the spotters, all right, the Israelis have a whole battalion of women, just women, who are called spotters, all right? That, that, that's not like in the old fashioned sense of, of peering with binos. They are, they, they stare at screens, surveillance camera screens in, in the, in uh, half a dozen IDF posts around Gaza. Now, there's a lot of questions that came about this, uh, one of which was why were they unarmed? Um, and, and, uh, but they had been reporting, um, you, these spotters, it's a very interesting, I don't mean to, this is why it could be a separate episode, but you know, the, the training for these spotters, they get, each one of them learns a part of Gaza, all right? And and they just, they they have that part of Gaza under surveillance and they know it so well that they're recognizing faces, people, and that's what they do nine hours a day in, in shifts throughout the day, right? So they were picking up a ton of stuff to include full rehearsals, all right, with, with pickup trucks, even the paraglider part, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and they were sending in these reports and were ignored. And um, there are, you know, I think when, as we pull this apart, and the same has happened, as I point out, in every single military in the world, or, or I mean, national security apparatus will find that the problems are not intelligence, they are cultural. Um, and, you know, this deeply seated belief that Hamas is it could not pull it off. Um, but it's a fascinating topic. And there's, you know, there's there's many more, um, sadly, many more stories here of, of indications being brought to to people in, in position of authority to make decisions. And those decisions were not made. Last piece is a lot of controversy in Israel right now. I mean, Netanyahu, perhaps not the most popular point per person there, but he is the prime minister, wartime prime minister, and the country has rallied around him, okay? Um, but contra controversy uh, over whether Netanyahu was informed, all right? The the head of Shin Bet, kind of unusual. You notice, you know, Netanyahu is kind of saying, hey, man, I, I didn't know any of this shit. My intel guys didn't tell me. And now uh, the head of Shin Bet at least is kicking, is pushing back a little bit and saying, nope, we told you about this publicly. So this isn't healthy. But it's, mm -hmm. you know, we, we're learning a lot more about, no, it was not an intelligence failure. It was, an, it was a mm -hmm. failure of people. Yeah, that was, so I knew parts of that. That was really fascinating. So uh, I'm not shining you on. I really look forward to reading your book because that, that whole thing. <laughs> I'll give you a copy. I mean, it's not just for, and I will gladly take it. Um, that whole thing is not just for the Israelis to review. I think that yeah. will be a lot of lessons learned for, oh, yeah. uh, you know, Intel services, yeah. militaries, and police forces around the world, right? On uh, even as effective as they are, as 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 impressive as they have been in the past, they can make mistakes. We can make mistakes. That that is something I think. Uh, seriously, putting that all together would be really uh, uh, good for a lot of intelligence services, militaries, and yeah, and law enforcement they, to read. Mick, on that on that point, there's two other points. You know, very quickly, all right? I, but um, the, the Israelis had a really good uh, central open intelligence unit. I forget what it was. But the problem was, and, um, and, and I believe, I can't remember if it fell under the IDF, under the military intelligence, or under Shin Bet. But, but the point is, it was disbanded several months ago. All right. I checked on this. Someone, the former, you know, one of the former national security advisors told me that. I confirmed it was, it was shut down. Uh, because they they felt that you know it, it it was better for each unit to have their own open source intelligence blah blah. In other words, not believing that it was a that it was useful, and yet 
tons of open source intelligence was coming in indicating yep. an attack you know a lot of people um arab speaking israelis were blogging um about this and the you know the um uh the other point which is also concerning is the israelis have a unit called 8200 which is their signals intelligence unit it is i i you know i'm no expert but people will tell you who are that it is every bit as good as far as sophisticated training um, equipment as NSA, but it's a question of scale. It's much smaller than mm -hmm. NSA. Um, and, but they shut down their subunit that was focused exclusively on Hamas and Gaza again, a few months ago. So you see, it's just the perfect storm, but as yeah. Mick points out, there's one kind of cause for all of this, and it runs deeper than any any of the individual proximate causes, and that is this underlying belief that they didn't have to worry about Hamas. Hamas was caged right. in Gaza. Hamas right. was preoccupied now with running Gaza itself and making money and had no interest in attacking Israel, even though Hamas was saying the destruction of Israel was still its first task. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's the, the, I didn't know the other parts about. So th those are those are other things that I think would be really helpful to, to come out in a, in a manner that sets out um, yeah. the kind of domino effect of how this ended up in such a catastrophic event. So both the Israelis can avoid it and then we and our and our allies and partners can as well. And, you know, whether it's the importance of open source. And I remember when all the intelligence ser services just poo pooed open source because it was, you know, it's already out there. It's not secret. So it's not really intelligence. Well, if, if it's, if it's important, it's important. You yeah. know, if they choose to, to do it openly, then we need to, you know, focus on it and not just, uh, uh, dismiss it. That's an, another in, example. In the siege yeah. of Sodif, I, we had an open source Intel cell and, and that wasn't mm -hmm. my initiative. Someone brilliant guy seal, as a matter of fact. So those two terms do go together sometimes. <laughs> Um, recommended that we do I agree. We open I'm one Mrs. Barger. and and uh, uh. and and um and it was and, and honestly we got most of our BDA battle damage assessment through open source intelligence every time exactly. we did an op you know we we would get the reports and they would even we, the Islamic State was even posting like um a list of their dead you know every time right. after a, right so so it was tremendously helpful more so than I mean, not more so in a different way uh, than more exquisite covert intelligence like signals. Exactly. Intelligence. Exactly. It's signals intelligence. Right? Yeah. Signals intelligence is like, you know, it's like the beam of a flashlight and open source right. intelligence helps you focus that beam. Yep. Agreed. It should, it should, again, it should be one of those arguments that it's either or it's all the above. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. It's totally what it do you, do you want to? You had. A, I know you had another question for for Mick before you let him. I come. wanted to bash Netanyahu, but oh, I thought you were going to ask about Ukraine. But go ahead. Oh bash yeah, well, I mean, no, not bash Netanyahu. I mean, it just uh, talks to like the kind of leadership. I mean, lack thereof, like where he's blaming his guys, and you know, his the Shimbet guys are kind of coming back and saying, no, this was like kind of known. He knew about it, and he makes so you know he ran on the whole thing of his like. Mr. National Security for Israel, right? And just to pass the buck, I know he's a politician at the end of the day, is kind of gross, especially when it pertains to something this, you know, catastrophic for Israel, which is now leading to something massively catastrophic for Palestine. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I for one cannot comment on this because I want to go in and out of Israel. Sure, yeah. I, I mean, I I'm guess. not, so I could pop off, I guess. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. And I know you guys have friends in the IDF and Mossad or Jim Bet and stuff, and I get it. Hey, well, we'll I slow down so. on that. We already got, uh, don't you remember? We already got all that hate mail for being. We'll always get hate mail. It doesn't unbalanced. matter what side we pick. I mean, you I don't I don't have a dog in this fight. I want people to not die Absolutely. at a Absolutely. grand scale. That's yeah. what I want, yeah. right? Like, that's what I choose. And I want humanitarian aid to go there on, on a, you know, unabated, yeah. basically. But at bottom line is, yeah, no, I mean, at 30,000 plus civilian deaths we can quote those numbers and we're not um but it's it's just it's just staggering yeah and i'm saying that not as a hand-wringing civilian but as a guy who's conducted urban operations at the sure. sharp end you know yeah so you know what but with all this will be sorted out in six months where are we mick yeah in your opinion 
Well, I certainly would hope that the, the major combat operations would be concluded, that Hamas would be to a point where they don't pose a military threat. Uh, I think the idea that they'll be destroying Hamas is, is just not the case, as Andy will tell you, or you know, D. You can't destroy a philosophy, but you can bring them down to a point where they can't use that philosophy to wage war against uh, their neighbor, in this case, Israel. And then I do think, and I understand it's, it's, it's easier to say this than to get into the weeds, but the only real solution is a two-state solution on which the Palestinians have autonomy, they have a future, they have a identity, a national identity, uh, and they're focused on building the capacity of their country, economically, politically, educational, all the things that a society focuses on, and they're, and they're, and they're uh, essentially not a threat to Israel. Uh, and that they are, have agreed to live in uh, peace and coexist. Uh, again, way easier to said than done. People have been saying that for decades. But that, I still think, is the answer, and it obviously is still the policy of the United States. Things that need to happen to make that happen. One, there needs to be a willingness on the side of Israel. So that's something for them to decide who should lead their country. But that has to be a willingness. And there has to be security guarantees on the side of Israel. Like, for example, can they develop a military? Can that military be supported by, let's say, Iran? Um, can they join a security pact with Iran? Things like that. Those are real questions that, from the Israeli perspective, uh, somebody has to answer. Uh, from the Palestinian perspective, um, the Palestinian Authority has almost zero uh, credibility with the Palestinian people. Um, they are considered widely as corrupt and ineffective. So there has to be what the U.S. keeps calling a revitalized Palestinian authority, which most people say would be composed of technocrats. People are good at their sector of the government, education, uh, agriculture, uh, urban development, whatever it is, and not just people who are tied to somebody politically. So there's got to be a lot, and, and they have to be responsive to the pe people and not just some political ideology, which is largely just reinforced from Iran. Right. So there's all sorts of things that go into the uh, concept of a two state solution. But I do think that is where we ultimately need to head to. And that's where the international community should come together and enhance that happening. Not just say talking points, but are they willing to contribute to an international fund to rehabilitate Gaza? Are they willing to ensure that um, no proxy of Iran is allowed to govern any part of uh, a future Palestinian state. So there's all sorts of things that the international community, but to your question, D, I think that's where we want to head within six months and into the combat operations, stabilization, reconstruction, and then this diplomatic path toward uh, a peaceful two state solution. Does that look like elections in Gaza or the West Bank? Because, like, I don't think what's going on right now with the war is exactly um, pacifying a lot of folks. I feel like it's probably breeding some extremism. So what happens if it's just a Hamas that's rebranded, that gets elected? That's a great point, and it is possible. That's why I'm saying it's easier said yeah. than done. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So there's now Hamas is more popular in the West Bank than it is in Gaza. Uh, oh, wow. and, uh, so it is breeding uh, some extremist views. Um, and although I don't understand that, because I think they're – Hamas brought this all on the Palestinian people, but it's not up for me to understand. It's still happening. Yeah. Right? So that is, if there was an election today and they were put into place, then I think Israel would rightfully say, well, we're not going to have a two state solution where Hamas, the group that attacked us on October 7 is in charge. And I think most reasonable person would see like, neither would we, if we were in that position. So um, again, Easier said than done, but I think ultimately, unless we want to see this cycle of violence with an occupation of Gaza permanent, uh, I think that the path that the United States, which can only be a facilitator, is not a dictator of, in a sense that we can't tell people what to do. The United States can only be as effective as the two parties that ultimately have the decision, which is Israel and the Palestinian people. Uh, but I think the, the United States should be a part of that. Uh, regardless of, you know, I don't do politics, whatever uh, political uh, parties in uh, power, uh, because that is the role we can play because we have uh, more influence on Israel than any other country in the world. Yeah, and I think they trust us. Yeah. I mean, would the U.S. actually go to the extent of like turning the spigot off, 
you know, the cash machine off? I don't see a political willingness to do that on either party right now. Sure. Um, the longer it goes on, you know, that could change, but I don't think we'll get there. Uh, I think we need to be a partner for Israel, but I also think we need to be, uh, you know, a, an honest broker. So we're calling yeah. low blows and, you know, good hits, if you will, want to use a boxing analogy, which I usually do. Uh, we got yeah, to yeah. be square with that. I don't think we need to do that. I mean, I don't, you know, I, I, I think, I mean, that's already, that's in the background behind everyone's mind is the knowledge that the United States gives Israel $3.4 billion. It's certainly, it's certainly there in the, in the media, in the Middle East every day. Uh, Israel's yes. very aware of that. It's not something that diplomatically we would ever have to even hint at um, because, you know, as Mick points out, we, it's not something we'd follow through. It'd be an empty bluff. But I think more subtly, um, there are things that, that are underway uh, to to pair, as in divide, perhaps, um, the prime minister from his cabinet, That hence the invitation to Benny Gantz to come to the United States that for many was kind of poetic justice because we've seen Israeli prime ministers before appeal to Congress above the president's head. And so here was kind of a tit for tat, not, not in that way, but, you know, so there are ways of doing this um, that are that don't come down to straight threats with a with a That's you right. know with a country that is an ally and whose national interests to some extent overlap our own and that is why Israel is an ally, right? I mean, it's not yeah. it's not because of the crazy right wing cuckoo you know evangelists. I'm mean, probably get in trouble for that. It's not because of that. It's because it is in the interest of the United States to have a stable partner, a stable and powerful partner in that part of the Middle East. Um, but that doesn't mean that all our national interests overlap. And in the end, I used to remind my guys, it says U.S. above your, your pocket. And that's what we all have to remember. And you did see uh, right. uh, President Biden at the end of the State of the Union when he spoke to that con uh, congressman. He was on a hot mic and he said, you know, I spoke mm -hmm. to BB and we're going to have a come to Jesus moment. I mean, that's got to mm -hmm. be like, I mean, I don't know if that's him being dotty or is that yeah. him actually like, you know, I don't well, know, sending signals. I, I think what he I think perhaps what he sees has come to Jesus and what BB sees as being brought to Jesus. are two separate things. <laughs> And I, I don't want to get into the tangled web of uh, no. a theological discussions here. What I yeah, simply right. mean is that they definitely have a different perception of who's leveraging who. All right. Sure, that's and, right. and the domestic audience is the key in both cases. So it's not. That's right. And, and, and it, I obviously don't do politics, as I said, but Benny Gantz is very well known and very well liked in the United States. He was the uh, defense attache from Israel to the United States and, if you know that's always a significant position, but it's really a significant position in the IDF. It's usually the feeder into the chief of staff, so the yeah. the most senior uniform military. Uh, and obviously, uh, Benny Gantz was a general on the IDF, so very very much respected and very well known. But it's up to the Israeli people to decide who they want to be, uh, you know, their leadership and their prime minister. Yeah, I'm I'm happy. Good. That's all. Happy that talking to you guys. That that's all. No, that was that was terrific. D, you did have before we let Mick go. You had one more question, right, about Ukraine? About Ukraine. I mean, yeah, you sure. saw the uh, New York Times, quote unquote, report breaking news about uh, the special relationship between the Ukrainian intelligence and the CIA, and you know NATO, other NATO intelligence services for sure. Uh, which I I mean I'm biased obviously because Jack Murphy, our dear leader, wrote a pretty in-depth article about over like a year and a half ago and like just magically because the new york times got the okay sorry mick from the agency uh -huh. to write this uh it's like news now magically you know uh -huh. while at the same time elements from the agency at the time jack was writing his article were actively trying to kill it and did and by basically i mean they did their job they, you know, shook a big major publication off the story. Um, I mean, the, the, so, by the way, they're permitted, not only permitted, make yeah, friends if I'm wrong, that's their but job. obliged to lie. When, in no, that's their cases. job and they did it well. Yeah. I respect it. You know what yeah. I mean? Like they, they, they made it work. Um, 
But you know, this like this intelligence relationship's probably been building up since 2014, I'm assuming, right? Like since Crimea got invaded uh annexed. Just speak to it a so, little bit and confirm so, uh, confirm Jack's story. <laughs> I can't confirm Jack's okay. story. I'm all, obviously obligated uh in perpetuity to sure. um, protect all covert and and uh operations as a as a retired CIA person. I, I obviously know Jack. He's a friend. Him and Dave, brother Dave, came to visit us right here at Whitefish. Uh, he's a great reporter. So but I you killed them in a heartbeat uh, if they came between you and national security. No, no, no. <laughs> no I'm not saying that. They both, uh, they both have, have served the national security interests in their country with great esteem, I would say, uh, uh, as you Winston. all know. Right. But what I would say is the the agency, the paramilitary community uh, in particular, and the soft community inside uh, the U.S. military does have key relationships that uh, they build over time that you never know when they're going to be critically important to our national security. So whether it's uh, in Ukraine or whether it's, you know, the Kurds, for example, uh, before the Iraq war or which then leveraged into our efforts in Syria with the SDF, uh, you never know where it starts. And when they, you have that young Green Beret or Raider or paramilitary officer that's out there building these relationships that they don't know where to lead, uh, oftentimes it leads to some of the most significant cooperative events we've had, whether it's, um, the, the, whether it's uh, building an entity inside Syria that can defeat ISIS, right? They can actually win without the loss of many uh, U.S. servicemen and women. That's incredibly important. Whether it was in Iraq, uh, where we could not get the 4th Infantry Division, and essentially it turned into a UW effort against 11 infantry divisions that was successful, or, in, or Republican Guard divisions uh, in the North. Uh, so another example. Whether it was Ukraine, when every analyst I know gave them, you know, less than a week uh, once the uh, Russian uh, came across the border and here we are where we are today, uh, wondering why they're not being more effective on their counteroffensive, uh, ignoring the fact that most analysts didn't think they would, that Kiev would last uh, three days. Uh, a lot of that, I, 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 I want to give 100% really of the credit to the Ukrainians, that, uh, but I think they were enhanced by our um, partner operations that both the U.S., military and the central intelligence agency does uh, that brings that core skill, that brings that confidence, that brings that small unit leadership to function in a way that I think is exponentially more powerful than their numbers uh, would suggest. And I think we do that a lot. And that needs to keep happening. Just because the global war on terror might be something we put in the rearview mirror, that can change overnight, as you well know. Uh, but it's also just as effective against uh, near peer competitors in Ukraine is a great example uh, of what they're doing to the Russian military, who is, uh, by almost every analysis perspective, been degraded substantially, like 50 percent or more, which is why it's so important to keep uh, supporting our partners in their most critical time of need, not just for, uh, you know, the moral right thing to do, but it's in our own interest. Right. Our power is relative to our enemies. Our enemies' power is going down substantially because of the efforts of Ukraine and our support to them. So I would hope that everybody would see that through the lens of U.S. national security interests uh, rather than any kind of political filter that might be um, to, to the contrary. Let's put it that way. What he said. That was brilliant. <laughs> I wish I'm glad we got that recorded. Yeah, so, you, so you are conf Rick. so you are confirming Jack's story. Just want to get that on record. No, Can't confirm it. I'll get a call tomorrow. No, no I, I, I am. I am saying that that, that it's well known that uh, that these partnerships, which can start, uh, you know, before conflict, can have a profound effect. Reveal untold conflict. benefits. Yeah. And and actually, uh, Mick, you you know, I'm, we're we're winding up now, but uh, you brought up a great point. That would be a, a good, another good discussion. Um, being able to reinforce success with a light footprint. So Chobani with the SDF, right, was kind of that. It was, hey, let's drop these guys' supplies and see what happens. And then Chobani held on, um, you know, and and we and we sort of realized, who are these dudes? That, these SDF guys and. And right. it became one of the most fruitful partnerships. In fact, I, you know, maybe the 
the Northern Alliance was the other, but uh, yep. of uh, the last three decades of self operations. Yep, I would I would go with that. I would say the Northern Alliance, then the Kurdish element in Iraq, and then Peshmerga, the yeah. SDF okay. in the uh, yeah the Peshmerga in mm -hmm. Iraq, and then the SDF I think is like a culmination of what really these type of operations can do with mm -hmm. a with a very competent partner, which we make more competent, enhanced by intelligence that we can provide, air we can provide, and on the ground advisors. The uh, the other part that I'd say to that is if we want this to be something that can use in the future. We have to be good partners. They can't just be disposable. You can't just decide one day that you, you don't need them anymore and throw them to the wolves. Uh, not only is that amoral, unethical, and not what the United States would stand for, Whoa, people Mick. will remember that in the future. And they'll be like, I'm not jumping in with you guys. You abandoned uh, every partner in the past. So it, it's again, it's not just the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do for us in the future yeah. to have partners that consider us reliable. 100 percent. that's right yeah syria and okay yeah we, we can carry this on forever but it, but yeah. what people don't realize is that it, you know as we talked about here before having that that presence in syria is not token <laughs> it lies right. it lies in an area that is that is dearly sought after by our enemies you know so that's we right. are again leveraging small amount of people along with ind indigenous troops um to to achieve strategic effect syria is absolutely. a success story in that sense for us i mean I'd, syria absolutely. is a horrible abomination but what i'm saying is that we i agree be, i right? agree and it's not only a success in the cp front but because we're there it has an effect on countering iran right iran yeah. would dominate if it wasn't for us being there yeah. the only legal reason we can be there is to counter uh isis which is part of the you know we have to we have to be in syria because we mm -hmm. fucked up iraq <laughs> we hadn't, right. if we right. hadn't i mean we can we talk got, about this in another episode but there's we can. <laughs> i love when andy gets honest i fucking love it the best uh, yeah all we right. could do another episode hey mick you uh you've been an awesome guest predictably d you've been an awesome producer too thank you uh and um Good job, you know watch watch Thanks, the mick. space uh we've got a couple of things and mick uh mick and um his cohorts are going to appear down the line to talk more about this, hopefully in execution. And then D has promised us a blowout eyes on weekend, long weekend at, uh, at mix. Um, I don't know how to put it. Bunker there in yeah, uh, feel very the, luxurious feel bunker the, in Whitefish, so Montana. We'll get yeah. the team house private jet fueled up and we'll all head out there. Yeah. Can't wait. Our, our satellite. We'll do an office. episode from there so you can, it would all be enjoy it vicariously with lots of weapons, porn, and you name it. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I don't know about that, but we'll thank you. Have us I want to remind everybody <laughs> to check out all of uh, Mick's stuff. Check out the Lobo Institute. The links will be in the description. Andy, check out Andy's Substack and Andy's Twitter. Don't forget to like, subscribe if you're listening to us on Apple or Spotify. Rate and review at five stars. And yeah, thank you. And buy my book. Before at least before the mix, mix comes out. All right, everyone. Thanks. Thanks very much. See you again in a few days. Bye.